Smith. Jeff Ogilvy survives Wingfoot. Now the moment Aaron Badley has waited. Curry Webb is the five-time Australian Open champion. Golf at its best by one of the best in golf, Peter Thompson. Stand in front of a crowd like this today and win the PGA Championship is pretty special. He's done it at last. Greg Norman. Gets his name on the Stonehaven Cup. Leash been to 11 under. And we've got a new leader, kids. Here it is. Adam Scott. A life changer. Coming up next, you have unrestricted access to golf across Australia and the world. Thanks to Golf Australia, we're going inside the ropes. Subscribe now on iTunes or your favourite podcast app or head to golf.org.au. G'day everybody, welcome to Inside the Ropes episode number 142, lovely to have you with us again. Uh, some of you will be listening to the podcast, the audio version of it, it is a vidcast as well, so others of you may be watching, for those of you listening, just bear that in mind, it might sound a bit odd from time to time. Lovely to be here, lovely to be with a couple of co-hosts on a huge week of Australian golf as we look forward to the ISPS Hander Vic Open, a great time for Australian golf, somebody who's been on the front line bringing it to us, enjoying it all, perhaps a little bit too much, <laughs> on and off the course, <laughs> is Ellie Whitaker. Oh, it's good to see you guys. Good Hello. to be back. Mark Hayes as well. Yeah, he's here as well. Hey, guys. Yeah. <laughs> you have been witness to uh, a, a great moment in Australian golf last weekend. I, yeah, I was lucky enough to be there. Um, when Lucas Herbert got across the line in the playoff uh, over at the Omega Dubai um, Masters, which was unbelievable, to, to be honest with you. Yep, what yep. a moment for Aussie golf and what a week for Aussie golf as well. Incredible stuff. It continues, and we'll talk more in depth about that and what Mark Leishman did at Tory Pines, but it does continue this little sweet spot that we find ourselves in at the moment. Off the back of the <laughs> President's Cup, you know, Cam Smith, you know, Adam Scott obviously here and now with a couple of international victories and the Vic Open just around the corner. We're in this lovely little sweet spot of Australian golf at the moment. And Wade Ormsby as well. Oh, we shouldn't, of course, we shouldn't no, forget Wade Ormsby. No. And, uh, you know, from Hong Kong to Dubai to Hawaii to uh, Torrey Pines, mm. San Diego, to around the world, dominating. And I, someone pointed out to me um, earlier today, I, I never really thought about it, but... Lucas and Mark, both members at Commonwealth Golf Club in, mm. here in Melbourne. So, you know, it's quite it's quite amazing um, mm. to have four wins of significance in any year that we've had them all crammed into January. It's mm. just next level. And to do two in 12 hours, Ali, wow. Unbelievable. Absolutely massive. Yeah, I was looking at the stats from it, actually, and they have we haven't had a winner on the PGA Tour and the European Tour since 2002. On the same day. Is that right? Yeah. Did so you, do you remember who they were back then? Here's um, a question without notice. No. You don't? No. Good, I'm yeah. sure I can find yeah. out You'll very be able quickly. to find out for us. <laughs> if only we're allowed to have our research devices on the... Ca- on the, um, <laughs> on the st- <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a heap to get through today. Laura Davies and Rebecca Artis are going to be joining us on the show, so we're looking forward to that. We'll do a deep dive into what's coming up, the Vic Open. Uh, we'll talk about this Premier Golf League, which is uh, fascinating. I'm not sure uh, how much we actually know about it. Some details are leaking out uh, earlier this morning as we go to air on a Thursday afternoon. But let's not bury the lead. Let's talk about what happened and let's start in America with Mark Leishman. Um, seven under the final round, bogeyed 17. John Rahm in particular is really charging him and he put together a hell of a last round. But Leishman birdies 18 to secure his fifth win on the tour. Yeah, well, I think you know, Rahm in, in, in a lot of ways blew it early. He was, he was five, four over through five holes uh, and, and his chance had realistically gone. So he could have almost stuck a fork in him right there. But his last six holes, six under... Um, that's almost unheard of at Torrey Pines. Yeah. And that's how good Mark Leishman was because t- to tear it apart early and then to hold every part of consequence on the back nine. Missed one, didn't he? He missed yeah, the, only the, the, one birdie, the par putt on seven. Yeah, yeah, yeah but, yeah. you know, he hold 10 footers here, oh, 12, 15 footers yeah. for par. Unbelievable golf. He said he's never putted better. Mm. Um, and for someone who rolls it pretty well generally, that's saying something. And 65, they come and go on different courses, but that's Torrey Pines south. Yeah. Yep. It's Tory Pines in. Yep. It's yep. just unbelievable. And his fifth win. Um, by way of comparison, Ian Baker Finch has two on the US tour. Wayne Grady has two on the US tour. Mark Leishman has five wins yep. now yep. in the biggest tour in the world. Uh, it's a slow burn, 
but he's still getting better. Yep. Top um, 20 in the world. Yep. Couldn't be happier for him. Yeah, and there's nothing to stop him from picking up another five. In all fairness, no. is there? Like, you look at his game, he's got a swing that has never really given him too many health issues as well. Like, you look at so many guys of his age and they've got... They've had periods where they've had to sit out and that kind of thing. And he, he's just been solid as a rock, mm. quite frankly. And you say that no one's ever um, putted better. You're actually right. So on the last day at Torrey Pines, he was plus 4.78 in shots gained, which is the best um, single round putting performance since the stats started is in that 2004. Right? Look so at you go. There yeah. you go. There you go. Just a couple we, of numbers. And we thought you were partying in Dubai. Yeah. I was also doing that, yes. <laughs> that may have happened a small amount as well. Okay. Well, that's well, impressive. We'll get to that later. Which is, now, they're power greens, right? Are they? Uh, is that a, there's a question without notice, but I think they're a uh, pu- I would think so. Yeah, over there, over down there. there. Yeah. I imagine they would be. So to be putting well, we'll stand to be corrected on that one, but assuming they are, to be putting well on those greens late on a Sunday afternoon um, is quite something because they there are a couple of putts on that last day that had players like Tiger Woods and Rory McIlroy completely befuddled. They were looking at putts they thought were going to die right to left, going the other way or mm. holding their line and missing 15, 20 footers by a foot and a half, two feet left. Um, so these were greens that weren't easy to putt on for a lot of other players in the world. So for Leishman to do what he did, that's remarkable. And it's even more meritorious, as you mentioned those names. That's This is the event where historically the good players come back out to play mm. for the year. So the field was awesome. Stacked. Stacked. Good mm. way of putting it. Mm. Um, so just even more meritorious for, for Leish. Um, did you see what he did um, once the dust started to settle for his hometown of Warrnambool? Did you happen to see that? I saw the video that came to the light with his uh, son Harvey giving him the gears about uh, not hitting his driver very well. (laughs) I don't think his son Harvey had anything to do with what happened next. Leishman Lager, you know the beer? He declared via his Leishman Lager social media platforms that in his hometown of Warrnambool, down on the west coast of Australia here, no matter wherever you might be listening, uh, he picked several pubs in Warrnambool and said that as a result of the win uh, at Torrey Pines there will be a happy hour uh, at several locations from Wednesday, Thursday through Friday, uh, all serving the Leishman Lager <laughs> to those who wanted to join in and celebrate the victory. So how, how good, good is that? that? He what? is a man of the people, isn't what, he? What are like, we doing? How could we... you find a more likable character? No, no, you can't. No. Andy, we, <laughs> we can get there. It's only three and a half hours oh, to well, from where we're we, sitting. Well, the, no, so it is Thursday afternoon as we record <laughs> this. There, I noticed there was one on a Friday between... <laughs> Four and five. So wherever you might be listening, hopefully it's not too late if you fancy you're driving a couple of free beers. Uh, Leishman Lager, follow the website, the social media platforms, and you'll be able to find out uh, where um, uh, where it is. Uh, Jason Day tied 16. Uh, Cam Percy and Cam Davis tied 36. The other most notable performers uh, amongst the Australians. I reckon a really good effort by Cam Davis, and he was mm. clearly disappointed with some of the putts that he missed in the last round. But, uh, again, to mix it with the elite of the PGA Tour and, and, you know, be prominent for a reasonable length of time, big kudos. Either of you expecting... You go first. Either of you expecting Jason Day to get himself back into the absolute uber elite consistently? Uh, I think if Jason does it, it'll be in the middle of the year. Okay. I just... I kind of... I always get this feeling with Jason where when he's had a little bit of... I mean, the you know, not being able to play... President's Cup and that kind of thing. I, I just feel like he's a kind of guy that is going to come back and warm up. He's not... You, you look at guys like Sergio Garcia, right, and they take a break, they come back and win straight away. Mm. There's certain people on the tour that you have them pegged and you know that after a break they're fresh and ready to go and I just feel like it might take him a little bit of time to warm up. What do you reckon? No. I, I'd like to see... If I see Cole Swatton jump back on the bag... Yeah, right. ...then I'm ready for game on. Yeah. I'll pick it all up. Because okay. I, I think he needs to find the motivation within himself to be the best player he can be, not just bob up and down and in and out of contention. So when he does that and we start seeing him just by, you know, almost by default, clearing up some smaller events if he chooses to enter them, then I think he's back. Until then, I'm holding judgment. OK. Um, supposed to know, we're looking into the crystal ball now, how significant that is going to be for Lucas Herbert. 
Oh, absolutely massive. I mean, everyone on Lucas's team, so he's got, you know, and I'm going to go through them because they deserve a shout-out, the way that they've handled um, him, in particular the last couple of months, mm. I think, and, and his last 12 months in particular. Um, Dom as a party, his coach. Jamie Glazier, who hmm. is his mental coach. Simone Toza, who was out there with him um, all week. What they... What they do in terms of managing him is impressive because Lucas is an interesting character. <laughs> he's, he, you know, he, he's the kind of guy that he likes having people around, but then he also has a tendency to isolate himself sometimes. And it, and it's kind of a little bit of a, an ebb and flow, and you've got to get the play right. And they had this incredible conversation after the PGA last year, and they stripped it all bare. He was leading after the first round at the Australian PGA at Royal Pines. Um, flunked it on the second day and he was really digging into himself. They had these really honest conversations and got the whole team to the right spot. And in my opinion, that's what has come from, you know, this this victory where it was kind of like the perfect race. I was thinking about how, an analogy for it. And, you know, you think about like the Melbourne Cup, right? And so you're sitting in the back of the pack and you're just waiting for a gap. And that's what it felt like with him. And he saw the gap. Everyone at the top of the leaderboard wasn't performing very well and he just kind of ran through and ended up, you know, getting across the line. It was unbelievable because he was started the last day six, day, six shots in arrears. Um, and, but not just six behind one leader. He had a world-class yeah, field above him, him yeah. including Bryson DeChambeau. We'll talk about him in a minute. Ash and Wu playing like, you know, a beauty. Uh, and you just think, even if he goes well, this is too hard. Mm -hmm. But those runs came, didn't they? And, but, and, and there he was with, you know, f from nowhere, there's actually a gap between him and, uh, can you say it for me, Bezadenhout? Bezadenhout. Bezadenhout, thank yeah. you. Okay. Um, <laughs> Bezadenhout and the rest of the field, which mm. is even more remarkable. So for him to put behind the first shot he played in the playoff and to pick himself up and, and come again in that hotbed, uh, right there, I reckon, is, there is Lucas Herbert. He's, he's going to have a lot of... His peaks are going to be triumphant. He's only 20... What is he, 25? 24. 24. Yeah. So he's a baby. He's got it. It's all in front of him, you know. And you get the sense that he wants it now. Like, he thinks he's good enough to be... I want to be on the President's Cup team. I want to be at Augusta. I want to be top 25. I want, I want, I want, 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 want. Sometimes impatience can be your worst enemy in this caper. But in that playoff, didn't we get to see what he can be on both ends of the Lucas Herbert sort of golfing spectrum. Oh, my gosh, it was classic. It was mm. classic Lucas, really. Like, so, he, you know, to put it into context, he hits... Um, it's a par five to finish, sharp dog leg left. He hits the fairway. He goes for the second and literally almost hits a shank. Mm. Like, it is... It, where he hit it in the water was closer to the ninth hole than the 18th. And, and as a commentator, when you're watching that... And everyone in the commentary box is looking to me to react and I'm dying a slow and painful death because I don't <laughs> want to say anything bad. Thankfully, Lucas said, that was the worst shot I think I've ever hit. Yep. And so I didn't have to say it, yep. which was brilliant. But, like, he, so he hits it in the middle. He gets a very fortuitous drop. I was curious as to where he was going to have to drop it into the thick rough. He didn't have to in the end. He got a drop zone that was on the fairway, which probably was part of the reason why he won. If he okay. was hitting out of the rough, there is no way he would have been able to get close to that pin. Um, so it's all of the chips go, you know, and all of the chess pieces going in the right direction for him at that point in time. Then he goes from hitting one of the worst shots of his life to one of the best. Yeah. Um, a wedge shot from, I think it was you know, roughly about 90 metres or so to about a foot and kept himself right in it. He actually nearly won it on that hole. Yeah, he did. Uh, I think at the point where he gets that drop, he's playing with house money. Uh, from there on, his approach after the penalty drop, the little putt, the drive was next level. The approach was quality, quality lag putt and a really good putt to finish. Mm. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the next six shots are elite. Yep. Uh, yep. And I think to do that under the gun, looking for your first win, three runner-ups, three third-place finishes, ten top tens, it's all weighing down on you at that stage, and he was clear-minded. Yeah. I thought that yeah. was awesome. To bounce back after the near shank was unbelievable. Well, you, you mentioned the word elite. Uh, were the celebrations elite? <laughs> <laughs> he promised uh, they would be. They were large, yes. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think of how to put it into context. Because you well, were there. You were was, part of this. Yes, I was there. Yes. So it's interesting what happens um, when some, once the tournament finishes. Yeah. So by the time I was out of the commentary box, the official presentation was done, and it, apparently he spoke incredibly well at that by all accounts but then they get shuttled around all over the place to get photos taken with various groups yeah. and so you walk over you'll sit down you'll get a photo you walk to the next spot you pose and get a photo and it takes roughly about an hour 
during this period of time, we were getting champagne. (laughs) And so we were slowly putting together a really lovely liquid dinner for all of us. um, An arsenal of alcohol. Yeah, which was great. And uh, and so, no, we ended up going out for dinner and going for a bit of a dance later. And it was very entertaining. Who cuts a better rug, you or Herbie? <laughs> Depends on the song. Ah. He, he goes all right, actually. Does he? Herbie on the dance. Floor, I'm going to bypass. I'm going to, well, I'm going to, just for a second here, I'm going to pretend that she's not here, mm. that she being Alison Woody can. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to have a chat with you. Yes. I love. I actually love watching. I love watching the European tour. Yep. I, it comes back in our time at a lovely time on you know, Friday, Saturday nights. It's easy after the footy to sit back and stay up really late. And I'm not as big a critic of the commentary team as some people might be. Uh, I don't mind the team. But I'm, the t- I'm nervous now. But the team was enhanced significantly by the um, addition of Alison Whitaker. Uh, there's no doubt about that, Andy. There's zero doubt. And the banter, I think, um, I love listening to Tony Johnston. So do I. So do I. So the banter there with Tony Johnston and, and Ali is, um, I think, the equal of any in the world of commentary in world sport, actually. It was lovely. It was very, very good. And I, I, I know that Ali would probably say if she had the chance that she's probably not meant to barrack in the commentary box, but when you're surrounded by South Africans and Herbie's playing Bezade and Out, <laughs> that's pretty good. Close. Yeah, it was good. Close. Yeah, it was good. Um, I'm all for a bit of a yell in the background, Ali, so next time just let it rip, can you? <laughs> you, you mentioned... Um, uh, Bryson DeChambeau, Hazy. Uh, it was a 12th hole he got called for slow play. 86 seconds he took to putt when it was his turn to go. Now, he's come out later and said, it didn't affect me. He's finished with four bogeys to play him so his way. It didn't affect me. I wasn't rattled. It didn't affect me. And he also said, listen, had I made that putt 20 seconds earlier, uh, we still would have been waiting on the next tee. So he's using that as an excuse for taking a minute and a half to take his putt. Has he got any grounds upon which to stand? He, yes. In my opinion, I have to give credit where credit's due, he has sped up an unbelievable amount. Um, it is night and day, mm. genuinely. Um, he th- Technically, they weren't really on the clock. And my understanding of it, so the way that the pace of play policy has changed on the European Tour is there's... That you're on the clock when obviously you're out of position in the yep. field, but they Which, also have yep. monitoring all throughout the time. And his kind of went into the monitoring section, which is less about strokes and more about fines, if that makes sense, mm. to, to make it as simple as possible. Um, he looked like he was rushing the last two weeks. Mm. Like genuinely, getting into the ball in particular on the tee, there were times where he looked like he was rushing from old Bryson at the very least. But he almost looked like he was out of sync. What do you reckon? Oh, I won't pot him for what he's saying there about the delay on the next tee. I, yep. I'm, no, that's, yep. I'm fine with that. But I will say that I think the tour's new policy was evident and successfully evident to me that for the last five or six holes he appeared to be jogging to me mm. just to make sure that he was in place and ready to go. Whether it impacted his golf, I'm not sure. But I like the fact that he clearly had sped up. Um, that's the rules being a big win. And it's about time... And full credit to the European Tour for clearly enforcing them. Speaking, just one one single note about jogging. Did you guys see Sebastian Soderberg's round? He broke the world record for a uh, the shortest ever round of golf. Oh, really? I think uh, he at least broke the... No, it might not be the world record. It might be the European Tour's record. But I think it was 97 minutes. He ran the whole way. So pl- legitimately you, playing speed golf? Or, yeah, or a, he was yeah. out in a wumble yeah. um, early morning, first out on Sunday, and literally ran the entire way. But you've got to think, like, the score, walking scorer's got to keep up with him and the caddy's got to keep up with him. Oh. And you've got a bat, like yeah. you've got a bag yeah. to run yeah. with. Um, but he jogged all the way around. It's kind of cool. And what did he shoot? Uh, 75. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's probably part of the question as well. So it should be. But. You, you, have you, either of you two had a go at actual speed golf? <laughs> I couldn't do two right. holes there. <laughs> have you ever had a go? No, I don't have the stamina. Well, I played nine <laughs> holes with a mate. At Yarra Bend, where we had, where they had, I think they may have had uh, here in Melbourne. They might have had, they had the world rank, number one ranked player. It was yep. a, quite a really, it was a good field um, that it assembled. We played nine holes in tandem, so I'd hit the drive. Mickey would be sort of up ahead. Uh, we'd sort of run, but he'd be, he'd be getting ready for the second shot, and then he'd hit that, and then I'd hit the third. We'd, so we were doing it alternate. We played nine holes in 32 minutes. We were stuffed. Those blokes are, and, and girls who, who do this are, and their ability to to play with their heart, yeah. pounding the way it is, is 
incredible. So to get around a t- like a tournament round in an hour and a half, there's no way he could possibly have been, you know, physically composed enough to play the way that he would normally play. I think there was a flight on the line. Right, OK, right. I, I, if I, I can't right. quite remember, the, you know, that maybe there might have been an early morning flight that he wanted to catch. OK, a little, <laughs> That he could maybe go. get on that might save him a day of, uh, <laughs> of travel away. Madeline, Madeline Sagstrom, LPGA, wins Boca Rio. Was that where we played Boca Rio? Boca Raton, yeah. Boca Raton. Yeah, Florida. Yeah. Total legend. Um, if you want to get on a bandwagon, I have been probably at least in the top three of her ticket holders for quite a while now. <laughs> I texted her, I would say, two or three weeks ago saying, just want to let you know, seeing the work you're doing, swing looks great, it's going to happen. Um, I say that to a number of people on tours and they don't always convert. Um, I'm the least surprised person to see her win. She broke the record on the Symmetra Tour. She won a number of times, but she broke the scoring record for and money earned when she was out there and then jumped over to the LPGA, went and played Solheim Cup as well. Um, incredible talent, unbelievable golf swing, but an absolute ripper of a chick. Mm, there you go. So she'll be coming. Is she? Am I right in saying she's coming down yeah. to the Vic Open? She will be there. Well, that's great. that's great. So we'll give you the details if you're interested on how to get there uh, a little bit later on after we've spoken to Laura Davies and Rebecca Artis. Um, we had our national day here in Australia. Um, it's always a day of some controversy, but we won't necessarily get into that here on Inside the Ropes. Uh, we do celebrate those... Well, yeah, no, we will on this show celebrate those who have been given Australia Day gongs uh, yeah. in the world of golf. And you wrote a story about it on Golf Australia's website. I uh, did one directly uh, for services to golf. was Richard Farrant, who lives at Shell Cove, just south of Wollongong. A fantastic effort. He's been involved with uh, golf administration for... Well, Con- consecutively since 1966, Andy. Gee, so uh, over half a century involved with various clubs: Warhope, uh, I think Barrel, and now Down. I'm going to f- I'm going to forget his main his main club. I'll come back to you mm. in a second. And the other player, other person honoured who has a link to golf is Melissa Noonan, whose services to people with a disability. Yep. Um, she's involved in Limbs for Life, and she uses golf as the, one of the main um, outlets to to get people who have suffered. Um, amputee yep. damage yep. Um, to get back not only into sport but into community and get a, get a group of people around her. So she's not directly related to golf, Melissa, but um, if, you know uses golf as, the, as her main tool. So awesome Brilliant. for both of them. But Great. you've got to say as well, is there a better time for that than the last 12 months? You know, you think about the Australian All Abilities Championships and stuff like that. Like, funnel them in, yeah. like, honestly, mm, and, and give people pathways where they can still you know, have all of the same dreams as everyone else. I am massively on board with that. Mm. I think it's becoming the much more, more um, accepted that this is a good thing to do. No, um, it's a great thing. And the other club, Andy, I, should, I just came back to me as I scrolled through the phone that's not meant to be on the desk, is Kayama Golf Club, and that's oh, where yeah. he spent the bulk of his uh, time, Richard Farrant, and uh, he's a life member, he's a patron, he's everything there. So congratulations, Richard, and to Melissa. OK, um, the new handicapping system, by the time people are listening to this... Um, it'll have been, um, it'll be online and it'll be active. So that's taking place. Um, what can people expect from uh, that? that this, so I don't know if you remember, those who've listened to the podcast over a period of time will remember that um, we had Simon Magdulski, the boss of rules at yep. Golf Australia, in explaining that 36 is more like 32, Stalford mm-hmm. points. Mm-hmm. So if you feel like you've played the handicap and you've got 32, you actually have, but it was a mathematical thing. 36 is really good. Mm. The biggest change for me in what's happening is that 36 is the new 36. So with the, with the changes that are happening with the world handicapping system, your handicap might go to a point where 30, if you feel like you've played to your handicap, it will now be 36. Okay, and right. The, and the key function of that is to allow golf clubs to, um, able, well, players to readily understand what, they do, what they've done and how they're going but also to allow comps to be played off different sets of tees sub- simultaneously, yep, yep. Uh, all based on the course rating. So the main changes, if I flick through my notes here, Andy, um, there's bonus reductions for exceptional net scores. There's a soft cap if you are starting to drift. Um, the, the progress of your drift will be slowed after you go three shots more than your lowest handicap for the year. Yep. Um, but primarily the change regulation, um, the third one is the adjustment made to the daily handicap if the scratch rating is different to par. And that's where this whole thing comes in. So if the, if the uh, I'm going to struggle to remember how this all works, <laughs> but the, the, um, the scratch rating on the day 
can be significantly different to par, but now we're not playing to par. We're playing and the, the difference between the two. So if it's blowing a hurricane, sideways rain, yep, and the yep. scratch rating 75 and the par 70, that plus five will factor in, and then you'll get closer to your 36 points. Right, fantastic. So that's yep, basically good. how it works. There's a multiplier change in the position. There's other um, regulations around the maximum handicap. I'm really struggling here, Ali. <laughs> maximum yeah, handicap no. goes out to, out to 54 but most clubs will uh, probably keep it at 36, but there is scope for each club to do that differently. So if you have a reason to be playing off 48, 41, whatever, your club can theoretically do that now. Excellent. So uh, if you didn't get all that, uh, you failed badly. I'll <laughs> sort of ask you all of those, to repeat all of those things that Hazy just said, uh, but we won't get into that. We'll get to the Premier Golf League in a moment, but uh, we're incredibly excited about what lies just around the corner down at 13th Beach, Barwon Heads, Ballerine Peninsula here in Victoria. It's one of the golf's most successful tournaments, and I say that not with any degree of parochialism. It's uh, seems to be a bit of a fact, and it's a view shared by some of the world's best players who've come down to play the Vic Open, the Ice Pierce Hander Vic Open. Um, we've had a couple of great women. We have a great women's field every single year for this tournament, such as the co-sanctioning of the females event. And Laura Davies um, is going to have a very special person in her corner down here in Australia, and I'm delighted to say they both join us on Inside the Ropes, Laura Davies and Rebecca Rardis, good friends of the pod. Hello, ladies. Hello there. Hey guys, how are you? Uh, where do we find you two at the moment? Um, we're in the Tourist Hotel in Narrabri. Well, we had you on the show not long ago last year, Rebecca, talking about the new life of the artists in that neck of the woods. <laughs> Back with sorry, my... guys, you, sorry guys, you just dropped out of, on us. How's the, how's the new pub going, Beck? We, we chatted to you about it earlier uh, last year. How, how's it all shaping up as a publican and a publican's wife? <laughs> I'm settling into uh, the pub life quite nicely, Hazy. I, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's busy. Um, it's a new adventure for us both, but uh, we're really enjoying it. We've settled into Narrabri really well. We made some good friends here already, and we're both close to family, so no worry. Uh, we're really enjoying it. So one of the main reasons, of, aside from Laura uh, coming out to be a, the, the, you know, the regular um, that she is on the Australian tour, um, that she's popped out to Narrabri to help Beck and a far bigger cause. It was a fundraiser for Little Roxy last weekend in Narrabri at the Narrabri Golf Club, Beck. Um, how did that pan out? And I'm sure Laura was a smash hit there. Yeah, um, LD's a smash hit wherever she goes in Australia. She's, uh, she's loved out here, but the, um, the day was really good. Um, we raised a significant amount of money for um, a wonderful cause, Little Roxy. Um, it'll, go, it'll go towards probably between six and eight uh, NAPA intensive sessions for her. Um, as we spoke about previously, she's a little 30-year-old girl with um, some really rare genetic disorders. Um, so the money is going to a great cause. And it was a really successful day. Um, had a lot of people turn up and support the event. Um, it was nice and warm, but we expect that this time of the year. Um, but like I said, we raised a significant amount of money going to a great cause. And I'm sure um, without it, I want to just single anyone out. I, I want to thank Matt Kaminsky and the PGA Tour for chipping in a signed flag from the President's Cup, um, which I know was a smash hit out there. Laura, were you, were you swamped with, uh, you know, <laughs> well wishes and people wanting to play with you and, and just shaking your hand, etc.? cetera? Oh, well, it was more about Little Roxy. She was the star of the show for sure. She was there with the rest of her family, her brother and sister. And, yeah, it was nice. We, we saw quite a, few, um, quite a few other players up there. Uh, Matt Steiger was there. He played in the uh, in the Pro-Am too. So it was a really good turnout. It seemed like the whole of Narrabite turned out. Lots of kids' entertainment. The Fire Brigade were there and dousing the kids down in the afternoon because it did get pretty hot, as Buddy said. Uh, but overall, it was, it was just a great game, a, a great day, and uh, I think everyone enjoyed it. Now, uh, Beck, I've got to ask... When you, when you bring someone like Dame Laura Davies to a place like Narrabri, <laughs> have you looked back in the history books? Like, have, there, have there been many dames that have, that have come to the town before? <laughs> We've got to get her title right because, you know, even she, she's not uh, the person that will tell you, but we all, we all respect Dame-O as she's known on tour. Well, as you say, Whitaker, bringing someone like Dame-O to Narrabri is a, uh, is a big thing. But actually looking... Um, Narrabri technically is the sporting capital of Australia or New South Wales. There's a big sign as you drive into town here, so they do claim all the sporting stars, but certainly don't think there's someone uh, 
uh, like Laura that's uh, dropped into town. Although I must say, Steve Elkington's from Narrabri, so that's a, that's a big golfing name from around here. Damo, I love the fact that you come to Australia and Dame gets turned into a nickname. Um, Damo, I hope you don't mind if we keep going with that because we love the sound of it. You've been coming to Australia for a long time, Laura. Have you spent much time in small rural town Australia? Or have you seen many places like Narrabri in your, in your trips out here? Well, the Lund sisters used to live in a small place called Cara. I don't think it's that small anymore. It's probably grown quite a lot. I was there about 20, 25 years ago. But no, this is probably as deep inland as I've come um, in, in the 32 years that I've been coming here. So, yeah, no, it's, it's nice to see country. I've played Moree Golf Club. I went and played Tamworth Golf Club the other day. So I've been seeing the sites. I went up to Floody's hometown. Um, oh, well, that's cool. What is it? Coonabarabum. I can't pronounce any of these blooming places. <laughs> Yeah, no, so I've, I've been getting around. I think Dame Edda Everidge has been here, so I think there has been another Dame in here before. <laughs> Classic. No, I have to say, Laura, I have one of my f earliest memories of being a pro um, was at the Picton Pro-Am Pro -Am at, at Ant Hill Park Golf Club and they didn't have a range. And I just, this is a bit of, more of a background for everyone else to kind of shape the picture of the woman that we're talking about. There's no, there's no range. There's only two nets. On the nets are those bumpy old school, you know, the little range pads. Oh, yeah. And I've walked to the first tee and I've looked to my right and I've seen Dame Laura Davies standing next to Caroline Headwall, who'd just gone 5-0 and <laughs> at the Solheim Cup, both of them there warming up in these nets like it was absolutely nothing. Oh, like there, there's uh, nothing too uh, big or too great. small. And the support you've given to the ALPG Tour in particular um, is unbelievable. So I'm, I'm not surprised to see you get on board with, um, with Roxy his cause I've got to say tip of the cap to you thank you no we just have fun wherever we go that's the thing about it. that's why I love Australia because there's always a bit of fun to be had and uh, everyone's just normal which I like so in terms of what comes next for you two Beck uh, uh, Laura you've got Beck on your bag have you for the next couple of weeks is that is that you two are forming a bit of a partnership well, yeah, that my, my caddy is six and a half years, Tanya Patterson. She fired me. She's now caddying for one of the South Africans. I think I just got too old for her and she decided enough is enough <laughs> with this old bag. I'm not going to carry her old bag around. So um, I just happened to mention to Floody, you know, do you know anyone who could caddy for me in the three weeks in Australia? And I was always planning to come to Narrabri to see the new pub here. Um, and she said, well, if I can get permission from my husband to get off work, I'll, I'll come out and do it. And then a couple of days later, she confirmed she was going to caddy. So... We've had a couple of uh, practice rounds where she's been learning the clubs and she's club brilliant so far, so all, all good, I hope. Are you, going to, are you going to let her pick the clubs for you or give her advice? Oh, 100%. I'm not paying her for no just to carry the bat. <laughs> got to earn it. I mean, she's also a really good green reader, which Tanya never was, so that's that. that <laughs> <amazing. God>, that. <laughs> I'm hoping hey. against hope that she reads the greens really well. But, uh, yeah, clubbing was good yesterday uh, around Tamworth. She got it right all the way, so that was very nice. Laura, what is it about the Vic Open? I'm not sure you've missed one um, in, its, in its new format down there at 13th Beach. What is it about this tournament that, that brings you back every year? Well, I would say it's a shame it's the very first tournament of, of the girls, just basically, of, of our year. I know there's a few tournaments down in Florida that the LPJ have already played, but... It's probably my favourite event. We get to mix with the guys. We get to stand side by side on the range and watch them hit it. And I, for my game in particular, I, I always like seeing them hit it. It gives me um, something to look at and, and try and emulate. And we, we, we go alternate matches with them. The galleries seem to spread out evenly between the two tours. And I just think it's great for golf. Laurie, you'd, you'd have to keep up pretty well with the guys, wouldn't you? I mean, you're no slouch off the tee. Oh, well, maybe, maybe 25 years ago, before all this really big technology came into the game, I was, I was OK, I was close-ish. We were talking about the days of Curtis Strange and players that, like that that were not super long. I, I wasn't as long as them, but close to. But now the, the guys, the Brooks Kepkers, the John Rahms, we're not even in this. Even, even people like Lexi, as long as she is, nowhere near as long as, as these guys, the way they hit it nowadays. Laura, is, it, is the talent pool now, on a week-to-week -week basis, whether it be Europe or America or down here in Australia, is the talent pool the deepest that it's ever been in the time that you've been playing at the elite level? Oh, without a doubt, yeah, there's no question. Every single week, you have your players that have it excellent years and, and they produce it week in, week out. But any given week, anyone can win, and you couldn't say that 30, 25, 30 years ago. It was... You could probably name it out of six to ten players. Now, it's, it's the, the whole field, if they have a great week, they putt well, they've got a chance, and that, that can only be good for the game. 
Now, Laura, I can't let Andy ask this question because it might take about three minutes for him to spit it out. Two nil West Ham. Spit it out. But uh, (laughs) the Liverpool Football Club's travelling okay for you at the moment, and Andy's a like a dribbling mess about how excited he is. Nine, 19 points clear, Damo. We, uh, it's, <laughs> yeah. ours this, it's our title this year. Well, I'm not saying it. You, you said that. I didn't say that. I won't say it just in case something ridiculous happens. But, yeah, I, I got up this morning at uh, 6.30, ready for the game, watched the whole 90 minutes as usual, and it's just incredible. They're just playing so well. Um, good teams are coming to Anfield. We're going to their their you know their, their pitches and... And we're just not giving them a chance. We're suffocating them. We're, our fitness levels are beyond anything I've ever seen in a game before. So um, I won't say we've won it until we've won it. So, so I, you, you, won't, you won't get those words out of my mouth. If I could put you in the cop on the final day of the season oh, or in a playoff oh at God. the Vic Open, which would you choose? Um, well, I'd like to... With the time difference, I could probably do both. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, uh, you two, all the very best. Uh, great. You're going to be a, a draw card no matter where you are in the next three weeks. They'll flood to uh, support the pair of you down at 13th Beach uh, in the Ice Pierce Hand at Vic Open next weekend. Thanks for being part of it. Continue success with the pub, um, Rebecca and Dame Laura. Great to have you on the show. Good luck the next um, three weeks. Thanks for being part of it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dame Laura Davies and Rebecca Artis. Dame. Dame-o. <laughs> How good's that? I mean, it's so... It, it, and she is the kind of woman that, you know, if you walk up to her and say Dame Laura, she almost feels embarrassed yeah. by it. You know, and, and it's something, a title that she's absolutely earned. The amount that she's brought to the game, you know, in the UK but also worldwide, cannot be understated. US Senior Women's Open champion a couple of years ago. Just rolls on and on. It's just brilliant that she still... I mean, it would be easy to just sit at home, read a book, have a glass of wine, have a putt local courses, but she still takes her game all over the world um, and probably believes that she can compete despite the depth. You know, it, give, me, give me a good four days and I can still mix it with these young pups. I mean, it's, she, is a, she is a giant of, of the game, not yeah. just the women's game. She is a giant of the game of golf, this woman. I agree with that, except I think she'd still come even if she thought she couldn't win because I think yeah, she, yeah. A, enjoys the travel... But the camaraderie, on, you know, in the women's locker room, and it, it just just being out and about, and being able to take her profession around the world and meet people like Rebecca Artis mm. and, and her, all her family and crew, that's what she, that's what drives her and engages her. So you know, she's she'll have a little Pied Piper army behind her at 13th Beach, Andy. Do we have a little scene setting video for the Vic Open that we can play just to get people who are watching the vidcast in the mood? Do you, you look like a man who has no idea about this. <laughs> this is... I think we do. So this is fraught with danger. <laughs> it says here, Vic Open video, 35 seconds. So before we talk about the quality of the field that we've got assembled, if we do have a vote, promo video, a sizzle reel, as they like to call it, the Younger Brigade, why don't we play it now? event. Nothing else like it is the um, slogan that they're running with 6th to the 9th down at 13th down in the Ballerine Peninsula. There isn't anything else like it in Australia. In fact, they're probably, you've seen more golf around the world than we have. Is there anything else like it anywhere no. in the world? No, nothing comparable. Nothing with the same... Uh, uh, I'm trying to think of, you know, the scope. It is... The Sunday at the Vic Open is unlike any other Sunday <laughs> anywhere because everyone gets it. When you're there, you have to go it go to it to actually feel what it's about. Anyone that goes there goes back, in my opinion. Mm. Um, We have so many kind of return offenders, if you call them that way. But it's about the event. It's also about the Bellarine Peninsula because there's so much to do in that area and it's so great for people to come and watch but also... I don't know. There's just there's there's something in the air on that Sunday that's different to anything I feel anywhere else in the world. I think people realise how important it is that we have the the men and the women together playing for equal prize money, playing at the same time. It's, it's got a social conscience, mm. and people are aware of that. And I think throw their support behind it as much as they can. 
uh, more so than any other tournament. But for me, Ali, being able to walk around when if you were playing, to be able to walk this close to you and ask you why you just hit a seven iron into that green instead of taking a nine iron and hitting it harder or something like that, you generally get a response. Uh, it's, it's unbelievable access. Um, the, the no ropes is something no ropes. that, you know, it, it's physically impossible at a major championship. I get that and logistically. But uh, for the size of this tournament, it's an exceptional thing to have. Uh, you, you'll get the chance to walk along... Side Damo and Jeff Ogilvy <laughs> and Lucas Herbert, all these all these guys and girls who you never normally get access to, um, are right there. And you can see everything. You can hear them talk to their caddy about what decisions they're going to make. It's it's unbelievable. And I, you know, I'm I'm full of excitement for it. And it's at my home sort of area. Yeah, you should be proud. I am. And yeah. I actually went and had a hit yesterday, a bit of a media day, Andy. And, and the course is coming together. But there's a buzz around the place already. You can sense that they really they can't wait to embrace the world as it comes. And there's so many different nationalities coming. Yep. Back in the day, even when the Vic Open was re- revitalised 10 or 12 years ago, it was still very Australian. Um, mm. it, it's truly global now. Um, there's Japanese tour players, European tour players, all sorts of uh, you, you know nationalities on both sides. But the LPGA powerhouse... Uh, feel with, that it provides is just unbelievable. Like the women, to go and watch the women in particular is next level. I have to say, there's one there's one thing that is truly, another thing I should say that's truly special about this event. So whenever the Open goes to St Andrews, one of the things that people say is you walk up the street and you see Tiger Woods going out for dinner. You see, you know, you see yep. um, Phil Mickelson buying his groceries. It is actually, I mean, obviously on a slightly different level, but it is a similar feel down in Barwon Heads. Yep. So you go to the Barwon Heads pub and you are going to be, A, struggling to get a table because it's always <laughs> an absolutely ripping week, but you're going to be on tables next to golfers. Mm. If you if you want to kind of see, you know, these people in their natural habitat mm. and just cruising in a really relaxed environment, that's kind of what the whole, you know... The, the whole feel of the event is, which is, <laughs> it's, which is really <laughs> typical. And the great thing is there's something for everybody. Um, First-timers, novice golf goers, you can go there, you can opt in and out of the course and the play. There's great hospitality areas. There's fantastic things for the kids to do. There's live entertainment um, to fill your boots day and night. So there's so much going on. It's, yeah. it's, it's not just about the golf. It's a celebration of the region as much as anything. My, my lovely wife, Andy, who really loves the golf tournaments that she goes to, <laughs> um, has gone for the last three or four years and yeah. just couldn't care less about the golf, to yeah. be honest with you. But she'll sit there and listen to the music and have a few nibbles on the local and sample the local vino and it's, it's pretty pure, to be honest. Go. Speaking of the local vino... Has, has anyone? Cl- I was looking at the field list. Christy Kerr's coming this year. Yeah. You know she's coming for the wine. <laughs> she <laughs> There's no doubt. Loves loves a glass of vino. Oh. Um, oh. She has her own. She has her own label. Um, she has Kerr Cellars. She also has Kerr Butcher Wines, which where all of the proceeds uh, go to breast cancer research. Brilliant. Um, brilliant lady, but great to see her coming down as well, uh, amongst a number of players that have just kind of flashed along. Yeah, well, the last time was you're watching. Simon Hawks, the defending male champion. I mean, the quality of the field is. Yeah, yeah we 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 wax lyrically about the quality of the women's field every year, and rightfully so. It feels year on year as if the men's field's just getting a player or two of significance deeper. And we've got some news on that front. We have. I mean, not often we break news for you, but unless you've already read the Geelong Addy this morning, um, I can tell you that Hao Tong Lee is uh, going to play the ISBS Hand of Vic Open. Um, President's Cup player. Just gives extra impetus to the field. Brings China in with a bit of interest. Um, just adding to that global nature of the of the tournament, and you know, a, a guy who's obviously the highest ranked player in the field, um, a massive, massive X factor, and a complete lunatic, by the way, when he gets a video in front of him. We're going we're to get the worst out of him this week, I can assure you. Uh, he's he's close to being. I mean, he's a, he's close to being legitimately world class. This guy, and I reckon by the end of his, I don't know how old is he, mid mid to late twenties now. Yeah, how tall? Yeah. By the end of his career, I think that. The platform that he's built for himself. If we're projecting again, looking in, I think it's going to be a pretty significant body of work that will be behind him when he hangs the clubs up. Well, when he, when he won the Omega, Omega Dubai Desert Classic, I should have said that enough that I remember it. <laughs> um, when he won that, he was the first guy into the top fifty in the world from China. So mm. he he's kind of you know the pace setter in terms blazing. of yeah totally. Um, and yeah, the sky's the limit for and that a- kid. Ali, there's another name that we can probably announce too. The uh, the world number twenty four on the on the women's side. It's not only 
Uh, the Vic Open, but also into the ISPS Hando Women's Australian Open the following week too. Yes, Hee Jong uh, Lim, who had a rookie season on the KLPGA, her last seven starts, uh, last five starts, she didn't finish outside the top seven. <laughs> So she's in form. She she's going wrong. to be starting her yeah. season at the ISPS under Vic Open. But um, three wins last year as well. Um, certainly a player to get on board with. If you if you want to like sound really smart at the pub and everyone's going, <laughs> you know, who are you going to pick? Uh, she's she's certainly one that they won't have heard of that should definitely be on the radar. Which, so Jin Young Ko two years ago, Andy, and uh, Jung Lee six last year. This is the third variation of that mm. sort of talent coming. Can I just mention that we have a... Um, major championship winner from 2019 is teeing it up as well. So Hannah, Hannah Green's going to be playing. So uh, it's a great opportunity to get down and see her amongst you know, the likes of Minji Lee and, and so many other great Australian female players. So uh, I think we've, we've, we've sung the praise of this tournament enough. Make sure if you do go, by the way, we've all got one of these in front of us. Uh, make sure if you do go, you pick up one of these down at 13th Beach, you stick it in your ear and you can listen to the radio coverage, which I believe you two got... What are, you, are you TV or radio? What are you doing? Uh, a I'm bit of TV. Both. Right, yeah, you'll be part of the radio I might slip coverage. on in at some point in town, so, like, if they let me out of the dark box with no windows. I'm sure. <laughs> um, OK. A- Andy, I should point out that before we just leave one last thing on the on Victorian golf, uh, there is obviously a bit of Victorian-centric um, nature to this particular podcast. The Vic government's been incredibly supportive um, and when you see on the signs behind us the mm. slogan right now is a golfing great uh, the Ballerine Peninsula has been opened up to a whole new set of eyes in the last five or six years which is fantastic some great courses down there, some rippers on the Mornington Peninsula side of the bay to the sand belt it's well known the river, um, if you're watching this and you haven't been mm. you know, you, and from interstate, overseas even, I know we've got a huge international audience Andy uh, come and check it out. It's it's unbelievable, and I think it'll open your eyes if you haven't seen this tournament or you didn't see the World Cup or the President's Cup. And we're really thrilled that the Australian Open, the men's version, is coming back to Kingston Heath this yep. year um, for the first time out of Sydney in about 15 years. So, yeah, uh, really exciting time for Victorian golf. And doesn't it feel good? Like you know, I'm a Melbourne girl. I grew up on the sand belt, and it has always been a you know quite a hub of Australian golf. And it's good to kind of see everything filtering back to. Uh, you know, one of the most iconic golfing areas of, of Australia. One that's getting deeper and deeper um, here and on the mainland and just south east of us as well. There's so many great places to take your, excuse me, take your golf if you come down to this neck of the woods. Um, okay, other bits and pieces that um, before we get to the end of this one today, the Premier Golf League. Jeff Shackelford broke the story about the World Golf Group and this pretty ambitious plan to sort of revive. Um, in a slightly more um, well thought out um, kind of process, the, the idea that Greg Norman was championing back in 1995, um, th- this kind of elite 48 player tour, uh, mega money, teams events, all these sorts of all these sorts of layers to it, we're starting to see uncovered. Um, 18 tournaments a year. Um, is, is, is pr- being proposed and likely to happen by 2022 if we get the will of the main players. Do you think there's a chance that this thing could actually get off the ground? Yes. You do? <laughs> I yeah. do. Um, the question is at what cost in terms of uh, their status with some of the other major tours around the world. If you ask any tour pro, especially those that are already well established, that have won major championships, that have families at home, how many events they want to play per year without sacrificing any earnings, they're going to say low 20s yeah, right. is ideal. They, yep. can, they can maintain a great quality of golf from 23 events or less. Um, so if someone is pitching them the same amount of money with 18 to 23 events, they are definitely going to take this seriously. So 240 million, so the details are still uh, emerging. A $240 million prize pool, there's incentives for winning you know, the individual event, there's a team nature of this, there's going to be owners of the teams, it's being reported for man teams, we're competing against one another. Uh, it'll be global, obviously, it won't just be based in America, all of these details as we speak. Uh, to be I'm not sure what you know about this, Hazy, or what you can tell us, but there is some speculation that the Australian Open might somehow be caught up in this, even though it was reported in one of the things I read this morning, there are only going to be 54-hole events. So, um, you know, the, the details are still... 
to emerge. But have you, is there anything yeah. you can tell us about what Golf Australia knows about this? Uh, well, I think I can tell you what I know, yep. what we know. Uh, the conversations have been going on for a couple of years, but I don't think that we're, for sure, well, I don't think we're anywhere near privy to the nuts and bolts of them. So. Yep. Definitely the Australian Open's been factored in. I think it's one of six to eight tournaments perhaps around the world of significance um, historically that have been considered. There'd be the South African Open, um, you know, maybe the Canadian Open. Things things that we historically treasure um, are being considered, I understand. Um, the 54-hole nature of it is intriguing because you, you can't afford to... If the Australian, the Australian Open is, you know, firstly and foremostly the, the pinnacle of the... Australasian players yep. um, season so you, if we want it still to be a 72 hole event there's going to have to be you know, a bit of give and take to be able to play it concurrently uh, I'm not sure how that works to be honest mm. um, but there's definitely the 54 hole that's been mooted um, you don't want to lose the significance of your key events around the world but by the same token it would be a huge boon for Australian golf um, on, on so many levels yep. to have a guaranteed 45 top players in the world every year you know it's mm. uh, Gee, it's got a lot of merit to it. Well, Ernie, Ernie was part of the con- Ernie Els was part of the conversation back in '95. Norman, you know, clearly wanted to get you know, th- this sort of calibre of um, you know the world's best players as Els was back in those days. He 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 feared the tour reprisal element of it back in the mid '90s, as so many did, and they balked. He has been quoted overnight our time saying the player power, the, the power that the playing group has now is more significant than, than we probably had back then. If they want to do it, it'll happen. As simple as that, he said. That's Els's view. So. I, can't, I can't imagine the conversation happening between Jane Monaghan and Tiger Woods or, you know, any, or um, Pally and, and Rory McIlroy. Mm. It would be intense, I would imagine. Both the other day when the story was broken, um, re- didn't want to talk about it at length at all, but specifically didn't want to talk about tours that weren't real. So it was all imaginary, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I, I think they want to keep it like that uh, in a public sense. It'll be fascinating to see how it plays out, but this has been talked about for a long time, even back to Peter Thompson's day. Mm. Um, but this was World Series cricket. This is what Kerry Packer did. You know, this was a crisis for cricket at the time. Now we look back at it as, that, you know, geez, why didn't we do it earlier? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, not, not the pyjama aspect of it, but the shortening of the game and the engagement of the crowds. This is what we've got to be thinking about. So I hope the tours are thinking about that as well. The PGA Tour can afford to shed eight to ten events. It's a 49-week tour. I mean, I don't know whether this we're allowed to say this sort of stuff, but, I mean, we say this all the time, the kind of the 52-week nature of a tour like the American tour. It's going to survive on 40 weeks. It's well, ridiculous to think that it's going to... They ha- it has to be one of... This, if push comes to shove here, it's ridiculous to suggest that it, you can only do one and not the other. I, I, if I was one of the frontline players, I would test that. I would test the will of the PGA Tour, particularly, any day of the week on this one. I think that the, the acid test there is... Because you, you don't see a Rory McIlroy going to play Sanderson Farms. Is that in Mississippi? I think it's in Mississippi. It's in that fall series. You mm. don't see those people going there, so it's not a loss there. But the PGA Tour will, and rightly, say, we provide whatever it is, Sanderson, Mississippi, whatever it is, we provide that community with a million dollars or $3 million yep. of charity every year. Without that, the community's um, a lesser place. Uh, you know, the sponsors fall off. You know, we, we lose a lot. And I, I, t- I take that point of view. Well, they, they, probably do don't get, they probably don't get a player ranked in the top 48 in the world playing in that event yeah. annually. They so. definitely don't. No, so they're, 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 that tournament can continue to exist. But will, it's the same problem that the Australian Open has in that if there's a bigger tournament on around the world at the same week, will, it get, will the Sanderson tournament get the same coverage if they're playing the Australian Open with the 48 best players in the world? And the answer is no. Well, Golf so the Channel will love it though, mate. They get, they get <laughs> yeah. an extra six or seven hours of content in the 24-hour cycle. I mean, it doesn't... Yeah, on different time zones. Too. Yeah. Uh, yeah I, something that should be mentioned, though, and you see it a lot around tours around the world, where it starts with a small tour going to this place and they build the event. They give everyone that is on site the IP on how to run the event, what is expected, and then the big tours come in and kind of poach it when all of the work's been done. It happens quite often. Um, 
it's not always that welcome, obviously, because the playing opportunities of the people that have supported that event in the lead up then all of a sudden don't have a spot to play in. Um, I'm going to be interested to see that conversation and how it plays out. Oh, yeah, for sure. Of, I don't Absolutely. think the PGA Tour are going to give an inch on this. No, they and, won't. And, and, and nor should they. I mean, they've created... They've created something. I can see the merit of this, but I would love to see this World Golf Tour go to places where there aren't events and grow the game. Take, go to India, all right? Go, go to, you know, parts of the Middle East that we haven't tapped into yet that are, that are potential hubs of starting a, you know, starting a golfing um, population that hasn't caught the bug yet. Like, I want to see them kind of take those opportunities as well and, and build the game for the greater good. That's the beauty of this. There's so many ways to go, and that's why it's such a you know hot potato in the in the boardrooms of world golfing yeah, powers. Yep, yep. Um, right. Uh, what other bits and pieces have you got for us before we get to the end of this thing? Any other bits and pieces? I think we've kind of crushed it. Yep. <laughs> you know, I think we've got so some, should, we've got some paperwork towards the end. I, sh I should mention. Um, oh, uh, can you talk among yourselves for two seconds while yep, I do one bit this. of research? Well, well, how are you going? Oh, well, yeah, yeah, everything's yeah. going. Should we talk flop? about some, some people to watch next week? <laughs> Can, well, can I, in fact, go on. Can we, Why don't you can do, we that? do that? Give me your tips for the Vic Open. All right. Because no. I know you've, you've, you've put some time and effort into this. I've so just put, yeah, on. by time and effort, I've asterisked Before people on the start sheet. <laughs> All right, just players of note. Celine Boutier, the um, defending champ, is coming back on mm. the women's side, as is David Law from last um, last year, which is great. Her Jin Choi, keep an eye on that name. Mm -hmm. Another one um, who, you know, was an unbelievable. She came runner-up in the US Open as an amateur. Um, Got to watch her. Greeny is back. So Yon Yu is coming out. If you want to see one of the classiest people in golf, like she's like a renaissance woman. She's stunning. She always looks immaculate. She can play the piano. She can cook. She's got a university degree. Like, She's kind of got it all, but she's also just an absolutely ripping girl. Just so you're new, you're loves, talking about. Yeah, so yeah you're she's, new. but she's missed out on the whole Vegemite thing. She could have had that. <laughs> she could have cornered that part of the market, and yet Ash Barty has swept up underneath yeah. her another girl who loves playing golf and yeah. wishes she could play more than she does. <laughs> um, but so you you missed out a golden opportunity oh. there. Shame. Shame. Mm. Kari Webb is coming back. Um, Anne Van Dam, the long-hitting oh. uh, Dutch woman who's won, what, four three times, four times on the Ladies European Tour now. Uh, she's coming out. Minji Lee. I mean, it's it's stacked. Well done, and I'm is. super excited You've about it. You've done well. Did before, you, have before, you sorted out what you need to sort out I there? do. And before you do your little guitar thing. I have here. to do that, Reid. Right? I'm looking forward to these uh, two little special off for our audience. <laughs> I want to do a big shout-out to Mitch Crabb. Um, who this week, Andy, I'm not sure if you've read this or not, but at Barwon Valley, while we're down on oh, the Ballerine Peninsula, it's not quite this. there, but it's in Geelong, at Barwon Valley Golf Club, uh, normally a par 70 course, uh, played as par 69 because one of the par fours was shortened to temporary green. So 69, he's uh, got to the 17th tee and thought, I could finish this 3-3 and the last is a par five. Downwind, hit a driver, gap wedge to a couple of feet, knocked it in. 10 under par, 59, if you don't mind, Mitch nice. Crabb. A junior from my club, Kerr Lewis, the mighty Kerr Lewis, um, gets the job done at Barwon Valley with a 59. I don't care what course it is and how many temporary greens there are. Well played, mate. Beautiful. Well, well. Standing around. Oh, just a piece of advice to up-and-coming um, golfers out there who would like to get some profile. If you do <laughs> want to get some air time, <laughs> become a member of Kerr Lewis. <laughs> Do something and you are an absolute guarantee to get a mention here on Inside the Ropes. This is, unfortunately, this is very true. Um, I need to read this. So for the audio podcasters, no issues. But for those at home, not great TV. Uh, for our audience out there that hold an official Golf Australia handicap, you could be on your way to Europe with two return business class flights with Qatar Airways. What's the hook? Register, Ali, at www.golfyourwaytoeurope, all one word, .com.au, and play to win every round of golf you submit, nine or 18 holes, with your golf link number from 7 Feb to 7 March. Gives you another chance to win. You must register, though, first through golfyourwaytoeurope.com.au. You'll need your golf link number before you can register. This special promotion is proudly brought to you, Australian golf community, <laughs> by Qatar Airways. <laughs> there you go. That's oh, pretty good, isn't mate, it? Mate, you are worth every penny. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> do, I, do I get paid? For, do I get paid <laughs> no, for no. It's in the mail. Check's in the mail. 
Oh, that's it. Uh, we are just about done. Don't forget, tickets on sale to Vic Open. VicOpenGolf.com is the place to go. They're the numbers you need to know. 10 day date, but so cheap. 30 buck a season pass, children under 17 free. Best value in sport, Andy. It really is, Hazy. That's, uh, that is absolutely brilliant. And um, there's a lot on site once you get down there, other than the golf. Good to see you. You too. Enjoy your time down there. Thanks, thanks, Ellie. Lovely to see you back where you belong. <laughs> Always a pleasure. Yeah, Thank well done. That. Thanks for being part of it today, folks. That's uh, episode 142 in the camp. We'll be back next week to do it all again.